<笑>主役は私よ Nine unhinged Juji Ito's Twisted to the Core stories explored. Fear is exerted deeper and more potently when it originates from something that is familiar yet incomprehensible. We can all get frightened of demons and Lovecraftian monsters, but what about when that same level of fear comes from something we are well acquainted with yet don't understand? This is the strength of the famous mangaka Junji Ito. He strikes his reader with a fear of the unknown. His stories provide only enough information to frighten us, and then we're left to our own thoughts to find answers. When natural and familiar concepts like phobias and anxieties are coated with the fear of the unknown and served on a platter, the reader naturally gets pushed into the alleys of darkness and horror. Junji Ito picks up these common themes and objects, processes them in his brilliant imagination, and expresses that very imagination on paper. It's so vividly terrifying and apt that we get a peek into the complex space called Junji Ito's mind. One notable feature of his are the horror aesthetics of the eyes of characters. These are drawn with an uncanny eeriness that gives an inescapable jolt from within. Today's video will be about the most celebrated works of Junji Ito, the man considered to be Japan's most successful horror writer in decades. We will also limit the scope of this video to his one shot mangas and exclude the more elaborate works like Ryu and Uzumaki. Before we go into our list, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click from you, but it means a lot to us. Thank you. Let's begin. <laughs> Glyceride. Yui and her family live above the barbecue shop her father owns. Due to the constant use of oil, the house and the shop are covered in grease, and even the air is saturated with oil particles. Her brother Goro has a weird fetish for drinking oil, due to which he has developed blisters and pus filled wounds. One day, when he runs out of oil to drink, he orders Yui to get him more oil from the shop. When she hesitates, he beats her up and gets on top of her. Their father, however, beats Goro to death with a pan and serves his flesh in the restaurant. Goro's meat becomes a hit and customers start lining up, but they stop coming when there's no more Goro to be served. Now Yui's father forces her to drink oil so that she will become like Goro and allow her meat to be sold at the restaurant. However, when Yui refuses constantly, her father himself starts drinking oil. Finally, she sees him cutting off his leg to serve at the restaurant, and instead of blood, grease comes out of his amputated limb. Junji Ito is undoubtedly one of the greatest horror authors of recent times, and Glyceride is a strong contender at being his most horrifying and unpleasant work. Ghouls, ghosts, and demons don't exist in this manga, but the tension and terror that Junji builds with the themes of oppression and family feud are mind bending. However, this did not satisfy Junji's hunger for the absurd, so he put in cannibalism, the murder of a child by his father, and self harm. The one scene where Goro presses his face with his hands to drop streaks of pus on Yui's face is just disgusting and frightens you psychologically. This kind of vivid imagery tends to stay with the reader long after they've finished reading. Having said that, Yui is not the only victim of this bizarre house. Her brother and father are both victims of the circumstances which force them to do unimaginably dark things. Junji probably wants to say that society stole their sanity. Splatter Film Ugi is a cannabis addict who lived for a while in the South American jungles with natives. On his way back, he brings along some unique honey that grows on a tree. Apparently, natives risk their lives to obtain this honey. Ugi lets his friend Sugio taste the sweet but warms not to get caught. Sugio finds it to be the most delicious thing he's ever had and soon develops a craving for it. Sugio tells his other drug addict friends about the honey and they all arrive at Ugi's house only to find his splattered human remains on one of the walls. They collect the honey jar and run away. While the gang of kids feasts on the honey, one by one they start getting splattered. Sugio recalls Ugi's warning but fails to make any reasonable deductions. Later, Kameda finds Sugio's wallet, which had a piece of paper that looked like a map to the honey tree deep within South America's forests. He travels to the tree as he can't resist the cravings of the addictive honey, only to be splattered by the branches of the tree. 
it is revealed that what they were eating was actually the blood of a supernatural tree, with branches that can reach anywhere in the world, and its arm-like branches would splatter anyone who got addicted to the blood. In one of the scenes, Kameda splatters mosquitoes on his way to the tree. The entire manga feels like an analogy of the human-mosquito relationship, where humans were given the status of puny blood-sucking insects. Mosquitoes come for our blood and risk their lives in the process. Junji creates an atmosphere where characters unintentionally become the victims of an inexplicable and unknown supernatural force through little fault of their own. The treatment of humans as insects feels both eerie and disturbing. This is Junji's beauty. He took a concept as common as mosquito bites and looked at it backwards. In the process, he made a few role reversals and boom! A creatively rich and psychologically terrifying manga hit the bookstores. The Bully as a teenager, Kuriko goes to a playground to see a boy Yutaro. However, he and his friends ignore her. A mother with her son Neo approaches Kuriko and offers her chocolate if she plays with Neo. Kuriko and Neo play together for a few days, until one day she starts finding him annoying and clingy. Things take a dark turn when Kuriko bullies and tortures him to free herself from the compulsion of playing. She commits horrific deeds before ultimately pushing him towards a violent and aggressive dog. After this incident, Neo and his mother leave town for years, only for Neo to return. The two of them start spending time together again, and Neo tells Kuriko that he loved playing with her as kids. Kuriko confesses this to Yutaro, who is now her fiancé. She breaks up with him and marries Neo. As soon as Kuriko gives birth to Hiroshi, Neo abandons her and disappears. Four years after the incident, Kuriko realizes that it was Neo's revenge, and she starts seeing Neo in little Hiroshi. She once again dresses as a child with pigtails and school clothes and takes Hiroshi to the playground, intending to bully and torture him. What started as a child continues in adulthood. Reading this story will send shivers and chills down your spine. The reader feels no jump scares, but is horrified by the sinister deeds a little child performs with another. Kuriko goes to great lengths to push Neo away, but in the end, starts to enjoy the torture in fits of sadism and rage. Junji Ito has given a detailed character study of a child with psychotic tendencies, and these tendencies soon took the form of obsession. It remained suppressed for years but rekindled when she met Neo as an adult. The manga becomes further unsettling when it provides the idea of a mother doing sinister things with her child. The story is equal parts scary and intelligent. <laughs> Fashion Model Iwasaki is a screenwriter who is working on an indie film with his friends. One day, he has a premonition of something dreadful, but doesn't understand what until he sees the picture of a hideous model in a magazine. Her appearance soon haunts him. He sees her while thinking, sleeping, and practically all the time. Every time he imagines her, she gets even more hideous and evil. He has another premonition just before the crew decides to audition women for the lead role. They hire Tama for the lead, and decide to hire this strange figure that Iwasaki has been imagining for another role. She introduces herself as Miss Fuchi. The cast and crew go to a mountain to shoot the film, where Fuchi reveals her fanged mouth. <laughs> Iwazaki and his friends are scared but continue filming anyway. Fuchi reveals her jealousy for Tama and infatuation for Iwasaki, after which some horrid things follow. The character of Fuchi has also appeared in Junji's other works like Suchi's Diary of Curses, Rumors. Fuchi is a woman who is teased and mocked by all because of her appearance and this kind of rejection turns her into a cannibalistic monster. She seems to have feelings for Iwazaki and goes to great lengths to have him for herself, just herself. Having been bereft of love and affection for her entire life, she seizes this one opportunity to make up for all the lost love and life's traumatizing rejections. After reading the manga, we felt that Junji intended Fuchi as the lead character and not Iwasaki. The entire story revolves around her while other characters exist to further her story. Fuchi will remain Junji's most unforgettable character. After having one look at her terrifying eyes and those fang teeth, you'll never be able to forget it. The fashion model simply gets stuck in your head. 
the licking woman. Tsuyoshi is going to meet his fiance Miku when he is attacked and licked on his hand and cheeks by a strange woman with an obnoxiously large tongue. Miku's dog licks Tsuyoshi, and both of them die a painful death with their faces covered in blisters and sores. As more such cases come up and bodies start to pile, the people are warned against the lady. When she's finally apprehended, Miku happens to be present there and gets licked, but she was quick enough to wash off the poisonous saliva and save herself. The woman is sent to an asylum. Many years later, Miku meets a woman named Nagaoka, who claimed to be a victim of the licking woman and tells Miku that she disappeared after her recent release. Miku and Nagaoka plan to kill the woman and save the townsfolk through placing potassium cyanide on Miku's face. When the crazy tongue lady licks Miku, she'd poison herself and die. The plan works out, but just before dying, the crazy woman bites off her own tongue and it falls to the ground. Later, Miku meets her new boyfriend, and as they start kissing, a life-size tongue appears only to attack and kill both of them. It turns out the Nagaoka was not what she seemed to be. The story gets continuously weirder and more grotesque as it proceeds. There's hardly any gore to creep you out, but Junji's unnerving style will freak you nonetheless. He picks up an innocent little organ, something that helps us taste, talk, tease, and kiss, and turns it into this bizarre and chilling object of death and disease. Licking and kissing are a very private and intimate affair, and we'd never like the idea of licking or being licked by people on the streets. Junji takes this sensible dislike and turns it into something hateful. The Hanging Balloon Terumi is a famous celebrity who has committed suicide without any reasonable cause. The modus operandi was hanging via a telephone wire. However, her boyfriend Shiroshi is blamed for the suicide as he used to complain about her career. As the news spreads, her fans commit copycat suicides and floating heads with metal nooses begin hanging below. These balloon heads seem to trick people into committing suicide, and when they've done so, their head separates from their bodies and becomes a balloon. Soon, floating heads appear all over Tokyo with the faces of all its residents. Each head tries to kill its counterpart, and if you try to destroy the balloon, then it will kill the human counterpart. Terumi's best friend and classmate, Kazuko, finds herself trapped in a room while her floating head replica is waiting outside to kill her. When the legendary Robin Williams committed suicide by suffocating himself in August of 2014, his death increased not only the rate of suicides, but also suicide by suffocation by a whopping 32% in few parts. This is the effect that celebrity suicides have on fans. Other examples include Marilyn Monroe, and in this manga, our poor Miss Tarumi. The floating balloons are actually the mass hallucination and representation of suicidal thoughts of her fans and eventually the entire population of Tokyo. Suicidal thoughts are contagious, and people feel inclined to act under the influence and example of others. It is noteworthy that Junji never explicitly reveals that the floating heads kill people. They only trick their counterparts into committing suicide. This manga proves that Junji is not just a proficient artist of horror mangas, but he also has a deep sense of plot. His story is so well-structured and inescapable that readers immerse themselves in rivers of mental and emotional strain. The Thing That Drifted Ashore The Thing in the manga is a giant oceanic organism with a serpentine head and transparent skin. Its carcass washes ashore on the coast of the Pacific Ocean, and scientists believe it's a prehistoric organism. Locals gather around the coast to see the monstrous creature, among them a child who has a nightmare about the sea and the creatures it holds in its depths. He is scared to death but gathers the courage. He meets a woman named Mi, whose fiancé Tadashi was lost in the sea many years ago when his ferry sank. She tells the boy about her dreams, and they are precisely what he sees. Scientists now notice that under the creature's transparent skin are scores of living people. When the intestines are cut open, many people come out, including Tadashi, but they're all zombified and declared insane. The little boy wonders about the horrors that these people witness from the transparent skin that acted as an invisible wall. The only problem with this manga is its abrupt ending. However, in terms of horror aesthetics, Junji has gone groundbreakingly Lovecraftian. Junji waits for you to settle down with a the theme and setting of the story, and then grabs you by the psychological neck to throw you into the sea of body horror and cosmic monsters. 
This is a manga that invokes horror by using phobia and the fear of the unknown, compelling the reader to feel that there are far worse fates than death. We don't know about you folks, but we feel traumatized and nauseated at the thought of being inside the stomach of a sea monster, and on top of that, living a zombified life. However, what really petrifies us is the realistic depiction of the sea monster. It's as if something like this possibly crawls the depths of the ocean and might take down our happy cruise ships. The Human Chair Yoshiko is a writer who gets numerous letters from aspiring authors asking for suggestions for their literary pieces. One of these letters is a confession of crimes by a carpenter who believes his work is so impeccable that he has developed a supernatural bond with his furniture. His masterpiece is a sofa he crafted for a hotel. He loves it so much that he doesn't want to part with it and reassembles its interior so that he can fit inside it. He sat inside the sofa just before it was scheduled for delivery. At the hotel, he remains inside the sofa and comforts women who choose to rest on it. During the night, he steals people of their riches. After several months, the administration decides to replace the sofa, and it is auctioned only to be purchased by a young couple. The letter gives the description of the wife, her husband, and her house, and these descriptions have an uncanny resemblance to Yoshiko. However, she receives another letter from the furniture maker while she's reading it. The young owner now reveals something dastardly to the buyer. This manga is Junji's adaptation of a short story by the same name, written by Adoagawa Rampo. Junji does justice to Rampo's work in this manga, and we think he increases the ick factor. He picked up another ordinary thing from his drawing room and gave it an unthinkable twist. We all sit on couches and sofas, but never stop to think about what's underneath them. They feel comfortable, and we submit to the pleasure and comfort. Imagination is Junji's superpower, and he makes sure his imagination scares you the next time you hit the couch or even your bed. It's important to note that Junji's work has a different ending than Rampo's. Army of One Michio is a reclusive man who reluctantly agrees to join a party where the attendees will celebrate becoming adults. However, strange murders are surfacing in which bodies are being found sewn together using fishnets. The killer is making art pieces with these bodies and people are in a state of fear and paranoia. The government has asked citizens to avoid public gatherings and parties as more and more cases come to the surface. The number of people going missing and being found increases from couples to small groups and ultimately mass gatherings of 500 people. Strangely, every time these gruesome murders happen, there's a reference to an unknown organization called Army of One. Its planes throw flyers from the air and its song plays on the radio. This one-shot manga is considered Junji's magnum opus. What's most frightening and mind-bending about the story is that the readers don't know why these things are happening and who is behind them until the very end. Initially, it feels like a serial killer's work, but as many bodies are found, we realize that one person cannot be the sole perpetrator. At this point, readers remember that Michio is a recluse who doesn't like social gatherings, but no one can say for sure if he really is behind the army of one. The setting and tone are shrouded in mystery, as is the plot itself. This is Junji Ito's least supernatural story, and yet it is more horrific, claustrophobic, and discomforting than any of his other mangas. So these were a few of Junji Ito's most twisted stories that make us feel like we're unknowingly standing at the edge of a cliff while an unrevealed entity is coming towards us. <gasps> It doesn't attack, instead scaring us enough to make us keep moving backward until we fall from the cliff. We are left shocked and terrified and have nowhere to go, no one to help us. Junji scares us just enough and then leaves us to fend for ourselves. This is all the time we had for today's episode. We hope you guys liked it. It would be awesome if you guys can take some time to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to tell us which topic you want us to cover in the comment section. Have a fantastic day ahead and stay safe. Kitayama-kun?